Good afternoon, Robert Scribbler. It is August 9th, 2018. Thank you for joining me for another climate change and clean energy video blog. Now for this segment, I'm going to provide for you an update on the present state of atmospheric CO2 as is measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory. And I'm going to be using information provided by the Keeling Curve website, which provides both a blog and a daily reference of atmospheric CO2 measurements at the Mauna Loa Observatory. Now, according to reports from the Mauna Loa Observatory, atmospheric CO2 readings for the date of August 7th were 407.46 parts per million at this location. Now, the Mauna Loa Observatory is used traditionally as a benchmark due to its departure from large sources of CO2 emission. It's up on a mountain in Hawaii, in the middle of the ocean, so most human sources of carbon emission are far removed. And it tends to roughly track the global CO2 average within a range of about two to three parts per million. Now, looking at the present trend, we see that average atmospheric CO2 levels have been increasing during recent years, and this graph is, is showing the past two-year time frame. Average atmospheric CO2 levels during recent decade, during the recent decade, has been increasing by about 2.2 parts per million per year. And right now, we are about two parts per million, give or take, above last year's early August reading. And it looks like, given the present trend, that 2018 will bottom out at around 405 parts per million sometime in late September or early October. And with the seasonal changes in the Earth's biosphere, we can expect atmospheric CO2 levels to hit around 413 to 414 parts per million by May to June of 2019. Given this range, we expect atmospheric CO2 averages for 2018 to 2019 to hover around 409 to 410 parts per million. And that's, that's rather high. I'd like to add some more context here before getting into the paleoclimate context, which is relevant to human-caused climate change. So what we will see is that by the end of 2018, adding in atmospheric carbon dioxide and all the other greenhouse gases that contribute to our present heat forcing in the atmosphere, we'll likely see around 496 parts per million of CO2 equivalent. So this range established by approximately 410 parts per million, 409, 410 parts per million CO2 average and 496 parts per million CO2 equivalent average is, is roughly equivalent to atmospheric greenhouse gas forcing during the period of the middle Miocene, stretching from around 12 million years ago to around 16 million years ago, and possibly extending a bit into the early, early Miocene as well. Now, why is this relevant? The, the, the fact that we have an atmospheric greenhouse gas forcing that is, is practically unprecedented for at least the past 12 million years and possibly the past 20 million years or so. Well, the reason why that's relevant is because the last time atmospheric greenhouse gases were so high, the Northern Hemisphere ice sheet did not exist. The Antarctic ice sheet was rather reduced. Global sea levels were between approximately 40 and 125 feet higher than they are today. 
and global temperatures range from approximately three degrees Celsius above 20, uh, I'm sorry, above 18, 19th century averages to above four degrees Celsius above 19th century averages. So a radically different climate and and it's worth noting that though the present heat forcing is not enough to immediately transition the Earth's system to a climate state that is similar to the middle Miocene, the longer we have such highly elevated atmospheric greenhouse gases, the more Earth system changes occur, such as ice sheet loss and permafrost thaw and loss of rainforests and changes to the ocean and earth system carbon cycle that that tend to push us closer and closer to that state and and this is you know we, we talk a bit about tipping points and and this is one of the, the the tipping points one of the tipping point discussions is that if you add more heat forcing to the atmosphere you you change the earth environment in such a way that it favors a hotter earth or a hothouse earth, and there's been a lot of talk about a hothouse earth state in the media recently. So that's one of the reasons why we look really hard at present levels of atmospheric greenhouse gas accumulation, as well as total carbon dioxide equivalent forcing in the Earth's atmosphere. And it's also, just to underline again, one of the major reasons why scientists and those who are concerned about climate talk so much about fossil fuel burning, which is the primary driver of the presently elevated greenhouse gas levels and the present high velocity of adding greenhouse gases to the Earth's atmosphere, which keeps pushing us closer and closer to those tipping points that, that we don't want to reach. Now, as, as for action, certainly ceasing fossil fuel burning is a major issue. And if global carbon emissions were to reach net zero, there could be a number of feedbacks that come into play that help to withdraw some of this atmospheric greenhouse gas forcing from the Earth system. For example, methane is a short-lived greenhouse gas, and that would tend to fade if methane emissions were, were cut significantly. Unfortunately, CO2 is a very long-lived gas, but if, if our governments and industries and individuals were very focused on cutting greenhouse gas emissions, then it's possible that some of the carbon sinks in the Earth system, carbon dioxide sinks in the Earth system, would tend to rejuvenate and help to pull down a, a piece, a, a small portion of this greenhouse gas overburden as well. So just some things to think about and also just to underline that, that we are in a rather urgent situation right now when it comes to greenhouse gas forcing. There, the, the climate crisis is real. It's staring at us in the face. It's having harmful impacts now, but the harmful impacts that are occurring now are minor compared to what will occur in the future if we do not respond effectively. So thank you for joining me, and I'll be chatting with you soon.